Hello, everyone. It's Dana Brooks of Facebook Brooks Law Offices, and you are back for another episode of the Empower Hour brought to you by the Empower Plant. We are so glad you're back with us. We have got a super special show today. We have got the one, the only, the Betsy Brown. We are so glad we were able to snag her and talk her into coming over to the White Hats because she's going to talk about career changes, y'all. She just went through one. And I hope Carrie Rowe can join us because she's going to echo everything Betsy says. But Betsy, welcome to Facing Brooks. Welcome to the Empower, Power, uh, uh, Empower Plant and welcome to the Empower Hour where we talk about all things empowering. We want to uh, share things that we've learned, triumphs that we've had, obstacles we've overcome to help other women uh, gain their power reach their potential and just climb the mountains. So thank you so much for joining our firm and our podcast and Facebook Live today. I'm so glad to be here. This has been a blast. I've yeah. been, I guess I've been here a little over a week now and everybody's yeah. been very warm and welcoming, so. Good, I was paying them extra for that. I told them there's like a 20. Yeah. Yeah. Rose and I have spent a lot of time together. <laughs> yeah. We are bonded. Speaking, <laughs> speaking of Rose, very important duty Rose has every week. What are we drinking today? This is an Irish mule at uh, Betsy's request. We took a favorite drink uh, for Betsy and she is a uh, proud Irish uh, descendant. And so nice. we're having an Irish whiskey. It's a Moscow mule, but with Jameson instead. Mm. <laughs> instead of what? what's usually in a Moscow mule? Vodka. Smooth oh, I like vodka. vodka. This is <laughs> Well, I never have vodka, and I, apparently it's vodka. what is the Not deal a thing against vodka? vodka? Which I'm for. I think vodka is way overhyped, way overrated. It doesn't taste like anything. It's awful, but <laughs> it goes in a lot of drinks. So I'm surprised it's not. In I mean, the bar we bar. had uh, white Russians last time. I'm just uh, out of vodka. Sorry, no vodka. Okay, got a small one. No, uh, Rose has <laughs> over the course of the last year or so uh, manifested the world's most interesting bar cart. <laughs> there's virtually nothing in it that can be used no. outside of an exotic recipe it's i went in there one time liqueurs and yeah. aperitifs and mm -hmm. good luck to you yeah. if you want to find a drink in it yeah no you got to bring google to the bar cart because you can't put a drink together with it's one of those things where you got to put the ingredients in and ask google what would this make yeah google what can we use with orange blossom bitters <laughs> yes and yeah Google told me Angelica. to get a car and go across the street. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Absinthe. What, what can we, what with those three, Absinthe. what can we do? What works? <laughs> you know. Empowered, I, empowered women drinking absinthe. That's, that needs to be a theme. Okay. Well, I'm in charge because no one else can interpret it. <laughs> no, you got to run that through the uh, Rose algorithm, the Rose interpretation <laughs> algorithm. All right. Who else we got on here? We got Kia. Kia, welcome back. Uh, have you spent some time with Betsy this week? I have not for long, but um, I definitely was one of the ones going over and bothering her. Hey girl, yeah. how you doing? Hey girl, so, yeah, hello. we got to meet. Yeah, she's gonna learn about having her face all over everything through you and uh, Brandon and, and Greg, our producer, and of course, Whitney, our uh, Empower Hour producer. So uh, giddy up, girl. <laughs> The first day. Get ready to never go into Publix. <laughs> Make sure to let everybody out. And don't you ever, ever go into the express lane with 11 items. Those days are over for you now. Look, I drive less than a mile to work and I pass one of our buses legit every day. So. Oh, even in Jacksonville, if I'm in a bad mood, I can't wear the basic Brooks top. I'm like, I, if, if I look at someone the wrong way, we can't. We can't have it. I, I, You're like, very, she's very that one. Way. <laughs> yeah, you look too much like me. Don't her. be out there with attitude. You, don't right, be out there right, with attitude. Right, look, look. Hey, yeah. I got enough of that. All yeah, right, we have got me. we got Carrie hey. Roan in the house, and Carrie knows Betsy. And Carrie and Betsy have one very important thing in common. They both spent years, years uh working on the side that is against what we all work on now, and that is helping the insurance company. Uh, pay as little as they possibly can on these claims that our injured clients bring. So welcome, Carrie. Tell us a little bit about how you know Betsy and why you knew she would be a perfect addition. Well, that's a good question. Um, I knew Betsy. I didn't really know Betsy until I started working at, at, as a plaintiff's lawyer. So um, I was on the defense side for 16 years, the same amount of time that Betsy was on the defense Dang. side. I switched to plaintiff's work when I turned 40, which I think is 
same time that Betsy switched as well. But I didn't really know Betsy until we litigated against each other, which is kind of like you and me, Dana. Yeah. I didn't know until I started trying cases against you. Well, Betsy and I had a couple cases against each other early in my career as a plaintiff's lawyer, and we just got along so well. And you can tell that our heart's in the right place and that she wants to help people. But, um, you know, she's spunky and she's driven and she's ambitious and she's incredibly kind and compassionate. So she can be a big fighter and a baller and a heavy hitter, but be nice about it, you know? Yeah. So yeah. that's what, I think that's what makes her perfect. I think that's what makes her perfect. She's a hustler, but she's a kind and compassionate and extremely competitive human being. <laughs> it's like it. all the right fixing. So she reached out to me a few, you know, months ago or whatever, and the rest is history. I love this. Betsy, welcome. Welcome to uh, the firm. Welcome to the program. Tell people about you. I don't want to jump the gun and tell some of the interesting things I've learned. I want you to do that. But I am <laughs> going to call on you to demonstrate why you are such an incredibly uh, multi-layered, complex, interesting person. Welcome. Tell us about you. What's your story? Story, um, let's see, where to begin? Um, picture it, Pensacola, 1979. I was uh, born, uh, the youngest of six kids, big Irish Catholic family over there, and um, born and raised in Pensacola, which is the cradle of naval aviation, as you know. Yes. My, dad, my dad was a fighter pilot, and um, so grew up there, loved, loved it, loved going to the beaches, it's a really great place, I thought, to grow up, um, but when it came time for me to go to college, I went to Auburn. Yeah. I got a degree in uh, accounting and football game attendance. And <laughs> you do math, y'all. It's uh, better than an MRS. Uh, yeah. And just, you know, had a blast there. And then when it came time to like join the real world, I, I sat down and looked at my options and thought, well, I'm not really cut out to be a CPA, but maybe I'll take the LSAT, how that goes. And so that's exactly what I did. And I, I got into FSU law school, which is a wonderful place to go and has produced some really smart lawyers. So I went there and uh, the rest is history. I never left Tallahassee. I've been here ever since. So started my career out doing workers' comp defense and then moved over to uh, civil litigation and on the defense side. And now I'm that for you guys. Love and it. That's about it in a nutshell. I love that's that. Career. There's a whole lot of other stuff we could talk about personal wise, but uh, <laughs> that's my career. No, we'll get there. We'll get personal. Wise. Um, I'm also from Pensacola. I keep forgetting that about you. You must. Did you go to Catholic? Catholic school? Yeah. Pensacola yeah. Catholic. Yeah. I know a lot of people who went to Catholic. I went to Washington. So there was a lot of um, crossover type thing there and um yeah it's a cool place to grow up and you love the beaches that's why when I moved to Tallahassee in 1991 I was like okay well where's your beaches <laughs> and they're like you got to drive a minute and I'm like well that's uncivilized <laughs> can you do something uh but no I got used to it now now I live at the beach half time down here so I've, I've found a way I found a way but it's not too far and if you've got family over there still that's just a hop skip and a jump so I love it I love that you're with us um let's start with Rose Rose why don't you've been spending some time with Betsy this week and you are learning more about her what is either something you want to know or something you learned that you would like to share with us about this empowered woman making a major career change at about 40. Well, one thing I definitely know about is uh, her love for the air fryer. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely want to, I want to explore that. Got it. So she is, of course, a working mom and we can talk about, you know, her kids and, and everything going on with that crazy life. But uh, as a convenience measure, apparently the air fryer has made a big impact on this lady's life. So we are experiencing the benefits of it today in terms of mini key. Oh, is this, is this air um, fried? That is air fried. Oh, hold up, hold up. I have, <laughs> believe it or not, I have two dinners scheduled after this, but I am going to eat this. You can get an app. You can get an air fried app. That's good. So good. <laughs> it, so I have to admit, after giving her shit all week, that mm -hmm. it is good. <laughs> you know what it's exactly really how you want it to taste. It's you got know what the crispiness and the yumminess and warm. It's not cold. You know, you microwave a quiche. Uh, yeah. Yeah. 
no. tell us everything about how to master that air fryer. But I would also like to follow up uh, with what you know about an Instapot because it vexes me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you've come to the right place, Dana, because I can walk you through all of it. The Instant Pot, I probably use like four or five times a week. Uh, air fryer, same. But first of all, air fryer is not a fryer. That's a misnomer. misnomer. It is a convection oven that sits on your countertop and it creates air that bakes the food. So those frozen little quiches took nine minutes. From frozen to crispy, delicious. Frozen. And no dish, right? There's no like baking dish. You just throw them in that little, what is it? A basket? What is it's it? A basket, which can go, you ready for this? Yeah. It can go right into the dishwasher. No. Score. Yeah. All right. Now, <laughs> how do you set up I'm your passionate Instagram? about it. I mean, you know, I've cooked some really cool things in it and it's easy and it's fast. And I love me a good kitchen gadget. What can What's I say? the most mind blowing thing office. you've ever made? mind-blowing thing you've ever made an air fryer or something that got the best feedback from your three children? Cool. Okay. So, um, you know, it's like pizza rolls, the little Totina's pizza yeah. rolls. Yeah. Okay. But you cook and they get really hot on the inside and you go to take a, a bite. And it's not really done on the outside, but the inside is like scalding your mouth. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I got a bag of those and I put them in the air fryer and they were like, golden crispy on the outside and perfect temperature on the inside such that we hurt ourselves at all so that was probably the number one thing i've cooked for my kids from their point of view for their perspective um that's important from, from mine i mean last night i made some really thick pork in there and i just seasoned them like i normally do and i stuck them in there and they were ready like 15 to 20 minutes, they were completely wow. cooked through. They were so juicy and good. Ooh. See, I'm always looking for something like that because I will lose interest. You know, if something gets too much, <laughs> I'll just abandon mid recipe. I'll be just like, mm, right. I'll just not do we're this. Done with this. But, but I wanted to do the Instapot, but I got really intimidated by it. I started putting it together and there was a seal and I'm like, this is probably important because it's kind of a pressure cooker and I screw this up. I'll probably blow my house up. So mm, I just, I just shoved it all back in the box and put it in a cabinet. Why should, should I not be intimidated by, by an Instapot? Be empowered. It's fascinating man. to me because I don't need to be intimidated by anything. Right. Right. Um, be the Instapot, come on. I do feel really weak. good security safety features that will prevent you from blowing your house up. So okay. um, I thought so because, um, <laughs> Oh, I've got so many lawyers. pressure cooker stories. There's, we need a whole uh, thing on kitchen gadgets. Hey, Whitney Claire. Oops, sorry. Her name is Whitney. It's not Whitney <laughs> Claire. Her mother called her Whitney Claire for 20 years and she decided she didn't like oh, it. So her name's Whitney now. So Ms. Morris, thank yeah. you for joining us. What Mother's would you like to ask uh, Betsy or what is a tidbit you've learned about her that you think is share worthy? Um, Honestly, I thought it was, I, I didn't know anything. I just heard, you know, she's awesome. She's badass. We'll love her. And I, I usually agree with people. So I'm not met, uh, <laughs> very agreeable, I'm, famously agreeable. Famously I, agreeable. Me, I mean, uh, we really need to worry about Rose. If Rose likes Betsy, which I think she, she does. Well, that is a litmus. Yeah. Then that's the litmus test. Exactly. I don't think I'm that bad. No. <laughs> but, no, everyone's been hyping her up. So, um, and I, you know, emailed her uh, prompt responses, uh, you know, detailed information, which is, you know, A plus in my book. And so I'm, I got a good um, intro for sure. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what I hear about her. Um, okay. Full disclosure. Everybody's talking about, let's talk to Betsy. She'd be a good fit. Let's talk to Betsy. And in my mind, she was a different Betsy. I had a. Okay. So <laughs> let me just say, so I saw her profile picture. And I'm sure she's gotten this a lot. And she is hugging an older woman. And so I thought, I assumed it was older. <laughs> and you so she, she, sends me, oh, she sends me her uh, headshot. And I was like, I, I did not think that was you. So um, yeah, but I'm sure you, I'm sure, Wait, sure Betsy's gotten this a lot in her life. No, I got this image of You thought uh, my Betsy. mom was me? <laughs> she's, 
She was, she was the prominent woman. one in the photo. I don't know what to tell you. Maybe you need to rethink. You gotta watch your profile. You need feed. to talk to our social <laughs> media <laughs> director, Brandon you need Brooks. To rethink that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He'll tell he'll tell you how to uh how to cute your stuff up. But Probably. no, I was I was in the in the mindset of a whole different Betsy. But I was like, listen, you know, I don't know everything. I like different people. So, you know, she doesn't sound like my cup of tea. But if y'all like her, you know, I'll meet her and talk to her, or whatever. And so we go to lunch and I'm like, I'm almost certain that's not the same Betsy. No. It turns out it was not. So uh, yay for enlightenment on my part and uh, being open to meet new people. I think that is a lesson. I think that is an empowering lesson. You may think you know something about somebody. You don't. So yeah. give them a chance. Open your mind. Open your ears. Learn you were wrong you know, and then move on. But uh, I want to I want to talk about that because I think so many times women give other women especially a hard time I hope we're evolving I hope we're not doing that any, anymore and I hate the way I used to hear people say things like you don't want to have too many women in your office because mm. they don't get along and you'll have all these you'll have all this hen pecking or whatever they call it. Uh, I grew up in that world in law firms where they would say things like that. You know, like we can have one woman, but we don't want a bunch of them because you know how they are when they get together. Or I don't want a woman at all because I won't be able to go out to uh, lunch with her and ogle the waitresses. She'll probably give me shit about it. Um, did you ever experience any anything like that? And I don't want you to call people out because we don't burn bridges here. Uh, don't necessarily identify them, but I want to hear about your experience as a woman in a male dominated industry, which is uh, litigation. Mm. Right. Well, yes, you're right. I've mostly worked with men. I've, I've been lucky to work with very supportive, um, empowered men who um, have supported my career and helped me out going forward. But, you know, some, sometimes when I've run into that, it hasn't necessarily been the guys I work with. It's the yeah. guys that I work against. Yeah. And then also, um, as remember, I represented corporations for mm-hmm. 16. So these were, you know, business people, many times sophisticated business people who, you know, would call me sweetheart or um, uh. ask can I, can I talk to the partner on the case, you know, not realizing I was the partner on the case or at least not acknowledging it right. and just, you know, never, not necessarily outright, um, insults, but yeah. just the little ones, the little tiny microaggressions microaggression add up to where you, you finally realize, okay, that's what this is, this has been all about. Yeah. And, um, so you know, but I, again, I've been real lucky. I think the guys that I've worked with, um, I've been mentored by men that have been great. Mm-hmm. And um, so my experience doing employment litigation and specifically sex discrimination, gender discrimination, sexual harassment, those types of things, those cases have really opened my eyes to what people go through in the workplace and women. Specifically. Yeah the stuff you see and you're just like I don't I can't believe that happened in this day and age and yeah I do so every time I hear it I believe it it's, I, it's I believe we don't hear more mm-hmm. but I, but we're starting to and you know and I and I don't enjoy seeing anybody experience anxiety but uh fear and anxiety is how you grow and so I, I see a lot of, of, of pushback from a lot of men that are like I don't even know how to act around women anymore Mm-hmm. I don't even know how to be in a, in a firm with women, or I don't even know how to, what do I say? What do I do? Do I get up when she uh, leaves the table anymore? Do I open a door to whatever? Um, what are your thoughts on that, Carrie Roan? When you think about uh, men and their treatment of women, especially in the workplace, especially in the professional environment, and what kind of a change are you seeing? Because I am seeing a change like, like Betsy, I always knew it was there because I saw the ugly part of it. I'm a little bit older than y'all. But I also am seeing a change. But then I'm seeing this, oh, kid glove thing. Like, I can't even be around you because that can also shut out women from opportunities. So I think we've turned that corner to where they realize that we are not the boogeyman. We're not just laying traps to try to sue them. We actually want to be treated as equals and have equal opportunity. Our, our motivation is not to ruin your ass, okay? That, there's a very low payoff in that, and it's a one-off. I'm looking for global betterment for all women, including myself. Carrie, what are your thoughts to, to Betsy and what we're talking about right now? 
Number one, I think it's a huge cop out to say, oh, should I handle you with kid gloves? No, just be polite. Just like you're polite be a decent human mother. being. Right. Be polite to your mother, your father. If you want to stand up when I walk in the room, that's charming. If you don't want to yeah. stand up, that's fine. Right. If you want to open the door, that's great. I think I open the door for people all the time. Men, the women. Time. Um, right. So just be just be a polite person. You know, the, the crap about, oh, I don't know how to act around women. That's just such a bunch of bullshit. It's so yeah. weak. So it's weak. weak. It's so weak. <laughs> I see a lot of changes, but I also, you know, I see a lot of changes because I'm in an environment where we are a woman owned business and there are very few women owned law firms in the entire state of Florida. So yes, I see a lot of changes because of the environment that I'm in and that we've created, but no, I still think there's a long way to go. If you look at how many women judges are there, how many women of color judges are there, you know, how many women- We're about to get one more. Right, yay. Thank you, Justice Breyer. Right. <laughs> so I still, it's kind of, it's kind of balanced by the fact that I, I get frustrated every single day when people ask me to talk to the lawyer on the file, Nick. Nick is my paralegal. He's a man. I'm a female. I'm a lawyer. So those kind of things get me frustrated every day and remind me that we still have a long way to go. Or my judgment is called into question, and they want to speak to, and they still do this, just like Betsy was saying. They want to speak to the the senior partner. Okay, I am the senior partner. Yeah. You know what I mean? I'm a shareholder. That's what you tell yeah. I'm a shareholder. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, kind of encourage Betsy. Um, it is a world of difference on this side where we're working for people. We're working for common people who don't have representation instead of corporations. In the corporation, in the corporate world, you know, I used to represent TMH. I used to represent Coca-Cola, you know, a lot of hospitals, a lot of insurance companies. And it very much is this way. And I know Betsy will agree with me where... The, the men are all the higher ups in those organizations. They yep. do all the hire the lawyers. And typically they want to know what the old gray haired guy thinks. They want him to be lead trial at counsel. They want to be him, him to be the lead contact on the file. It's still like that. One of the reasons I got out and I'm pretty sure that's one of the reasons Betsy got out. Betsy, why did you switch? And I, and I want to preface this question a little bit because right now, and I say this so often, but it is so meaningful to me right now, women are in the workplace at the lowest number since the eighties. Wow. And that's because of COVID because whenever somebody needs to get out to take care of your mama, my mama, your aunt, our grandmother, our kids, our, your kids cool. from another relationship, yeah. whatever, it's always the woman who is perceived as the natural caregiver and so unless she's already earning a quite a bit, it usually makes the most sense for her to leave the workplace and stay at home. My problem with that is it's not a pause button. It's not like putting your career on hold. And when you're ready to go back, you just take it off hold and nothing's changed. No, babe, the world has passed you by. Your contacts are irrelevant. Your knowledge is irrelevant. Your technical skills, you better believe are irrelevant. So Staying out of the workplace is just one more boot on a woman's neck that's going to keep us down collectively from having power and be and having representation in decision making roles. So uh, we want to talk about a few things with you, Betsy. We want to talk about how the hell you're able to do this parenting three children, how the hell you're able to stay in the marketplace, and not only stay in it, feel strong enough about yourself and empowered enough in what you know you can do and the people you can serve that you were willing to risk what you had security in for 16 years and make a big career change and come here? Mm -hmm. Well, um, first of all, like the kid thing, that has not been easy. And, you know, we've talked with um, we've clients that are in that boat, you know, as, we, as I've been calling them and introducing myself to them and getting to know them. And that's just what you said about, um, working and being the natural caregiver and they're they're the ones who are expected to not only care for the children but also support them yes. so and i think that's a that's a new reality for women is. is we we don't have the same options that people did in the past just to stay home and the, and the man goes off and earns all all the money i think that the marketplace has changed i yes. think um the job the whole the entire job availability has changed so we I never really saw that as an option for myself. And so, but you just, you make it, my mom is so wise. She said, she's got six kids and she said, you know what? You have to do in life. Yeah. And she gave me two, 
one. The other one is you take it one day at a time. And you do, because for a lot of years, Dana, I was in survival. Yeah. I had my twins and then I had three kids under three and I was working full time as a litigator and, you know, and having to parent the kids. And um, I mean, I pumped 80 ounces of milk a day and mm -hmm. I did it in the office. And I would try to lock my door. I would put like a chair against the door and the guys would just come right on in like, and then I'm sitting there with my pump going and they just come right. They on deserve in. what they get. And it you was walk in a closed huge. door. You deserve what you get. And the whole <laughs> office, it was a huge joke when that happened. And I'm like, here I am trying to, you know, do the best thing I can for my kids. Cause I could never nurse them. I could only pump for them. And so I tried to do that. I did that for like six or seven months and, um, you know, it was hard, but but I, I don't know. I just kept at it and made it happen. And I felt like I was driven to do it. And, and so I did. Um, and some of my hardest years of my career, just like case-wise, the types of cases I was dealing with, the complexity of those happened during that time frame. Of course. So it was, uh, it was a lot. But, yeah. you know, as they got older, they got a little bit more self-sufficient. And, and, you know, my twins are nine now. And my daughter is 12 and they, they have each other to play with, which is a huge deal. So that's yes. paying off. And um, yeah, so we, we just talked to a client today who's, who's got toddler twins and I gave her a few tricks of the trade, just good, mostly encouragement because what I did not get enough of was encouragement. People would be like, oh, how are you doing it? You know, you can't. <laughs> How can you like it was always that negative yeah. reinforcement yeah. and I was always working against that. Yeah. So when yeah. I come across people like that, I try to tell them, no, you can do this. I yeah. And kind of give them that encouragement that I think they probably need and aren't getting yeah. a lot. Yeah, you can do it. And it's not gonna last forever. Mm -hmm. I don't know how bad it is. Um, what I find is is an is a disparity, and I don't think it's natural, I think it's learned. And I think we can overcome it. It's just when you look at men and women, men and women working, earning money, men and women contributing to the household and taking care of children. Even if the, the woman is the higher earner, which is still not often the case, more so now than it ever has been. But even if, you know, she said, okay, I'm gonna keep working. The man, just because of our conditioning and expectations, even if he's a lower income earner, his psyche, number one, can't adjust to him being the stay at home guy. That's number one is a blow to ego, which can cripple, you know, a man just because of the way they've been conditioned to, to feel what being a man is. So that's a problem. And then even if we even if we could have them drop out of the workforce and they be the COVID caregivers or whatever, they don't have those caregiving skills. Mm -hmm. They weren't raised to be little girls. They weren't given kitchen sets when they were little. They weren't given dolls. They weren't given anything to take care of. They were told to go out, conquer, be tough, don't cry, and be protectors and providers. So uh, even if all things were equal financially, mm -hmm. we still have that disparity. So it's not really even an option. So you see so many times now that there are women who are the higher earners or could be they're still dropping out of the workplace, hurting themselves and their, fi their family long-term yeah. to meet an immediate need. Uh, with, and it's, 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 it's at a great cost. And so I, I want everybody to consider that and think about that. No one is a natural anything, in my view. I think you're what you are by your conditions. Um, as women take on more traditional male roles, you'll see more traditional male behaviors in them because it has nothing to do with gender. It has nothing to do with your life and your responsibility. So I love that enlightening part of it. What I hate is that's just one more boot on the neck of uh, women that we're going to have to overcome. The good news is we can do things uh, faster and more efficiently having had so much suffering and experience with not winning we've had to become agile and adept. So I'm encouraged for us in that regard. I want to hear a little bit from, let's see who we've not heard from. I want to hear from Winnie a little bit on that topic and, and Rose on that topic. And then we're going to talk about something that involves our health and what a challenge that could be. So Whitney, you go first. Thoughts. 
Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm youngest here, I guess, not by much, but I am the youngest. And um, I have experienced some of the things you guys have talked about, um, even though I've had a lot more advantages of working in a, a female-led um, or woman-led company. And overall, I think it's made me hyper-vigilant or hi hyper-aware of people saying things that are off color or um, detrimental to women. Um, and I was seeing this, uh, I mean, we all love TikTok here. So I was seeing this TikTok and uh, this woman, I think she's in the South, but she goes, my friend just told me that she pays, like she'll put her car down on a first date, like to pay for it. And uh, she goes, I have never done that. I have never paid for a first date. <laughs> and I, and I'm the same way. I'm like, no, like I, I spent hours getting ready. I paid all this money for my hair, makeup and whatever. Like, no, you can pick up my $50 drink and, and appetizer tab. Okay. Whatever. So that's kind of how a lot of people feel. But then another person's like, well, doesn't that um, preface that he's a fi financially superior to you? Doesn't that just set that the tone for the rest of your relationship? Yeah, there's so a lot of things to think about there. Yeah, there's a lot. But my point in this is just there's so many things that we think we know about, like this is the answer to making this equal. And, yeah. you know, it, even though it's wrong, finding the solution has been so difficult and yes. this challenge for equality. Um, that, that's my two cents on it. Yeah. No, I see that a hundred percent. Um, yeah, because some, what, what, what if this, what if you're dating and you make substantially more than that person, you know, are you, uh, are you supposed to pay the freight on everything? Cause me personally, I look at men, especially the white ones <laughs> in America. And I'm going, why aren't you making as much as I am? You've had every damn opportunity. You've had every privilege. You, every door was open. You just had to get up and walk through it. Yep. So I don't care if I am balling. You need to pay. Stand up. Exactly. <laughs> Not for punishment, but you know what I'm saying? It's just like, why aren't you killing it? Why did you opt out? I didn't get to opt out or I, I, I mean, I got to eat. So I don't know. There's a lot. To, I, I wrote about that in my book. I said, I struggle with this. Yeah. I struggle with this. Because um, I don't think you should just look at a woman who's making it and go, all things are equal now. No, Hooker, I had to go through a lot more than you did to get mm -hmm. here. So uh -uh, I need some reparations, sir. Hello. Thank you. All right, Kia, I want to hear from you. Um, what are you thinking right now? Because I do want to go into the next thing, because I know me, I'll talk too much and run out of time, and I don't want to give short shrift to it. Uh, Betsy had a serious health scare, and I want her to talk about that in the middle of all this other stuff going on. But Kia, you first. Um, I want to say I'm definitely excited about having you here. Um, two things. You, know, you had to make this career change. So when did you know that this was your passion? Boom. Um, Good question. And then secondly, considering that you worked on the side of, um, you know, human trafficking, of course, this month is National Slavery and Human Trafficking Prevention Month. Um, so I'm just wondering, what was one of the most impactful cases that you probably had to deal with, um, you know, when handling one of those cases, um, especially since one of these cases are now turning into mass torts, um, which you definitely can call Facebook Brooks and get additional information on that. That's so right. Call with that. Would oh, you like to see our plug? I'm just saying 850-777-7777. Thank you. <laughs> so, Betsy, all you. Okay, well, thanks. First question was, you know, when did I know I wanted to make this career change? I um, actually for a really long time, but I knew that it had, if I was going to do that, like it would have to be with a really good firm, with people I trusted and that people that I believed in and that would believe in me and that I get along with and I would just like. And so I, um, you know, Carrie and I had this conversation a few years ago and I just kind of, you know, I mentioned it to her and, um, I think she kept it in the back of her mind. And then when the time was right, we, you know, we linked back up and it, it the timing couldn't have been more perfect for me. And so, you know, I'm really excited. What, what excites me the most is just um, a new challenge, having, having the ability to use thing that I think I have a gift for, which is dealing with people. Yeah. 
possible to actually use that and use it in a way that that helps them and that you know helps the firm and and it's just something more that I can offer. And so um, so that's the answer to that question. It's been a few years and I just became disenchanted over the years and just theory a lot. Right. And I liked Kimmy. I've worked with Kimmy a ton. Kimmy's and everything. um and I just and I knew and I knew Jimmy really well. I've had cases with all of them over the years. And what's funny is you get to know that the lawyers on the other side better than you get to know the lawyers on your same side. Oh yeah. Because you're talking all the time and you're yeah. dealing with things out and you're you know talking through things and you get to, you know, form relationships. And so they were my favorites. So when when the opportunity popped up, I I mean I really didn't have to to think that hard about it. It was um, it was a, a wonderful opportunity that I'm glad to have. I'm so glad you're here. I know you are exactly the right fit. Um, you know, Carrie, Carrie and I had that dynamic when we were litigating against each other. I, I write about it. I was like, you know, we were in the car driving. We would drive to Jacksonville to depositions together. I mean, most people don't do that. And we'd yeah. go, burr, 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 and then we get off the deposition and go, hey, Cheesecake Factory and Shoes, you want to do that? Yes, let's spend our <laughs> afternoon doing that. Um, it was just awesome. And then, you know, you like somebody and then you could tell. I remember with Carrie, we tried a case against each other and uh, she was in a firm where even though she was incredibly qualified, she got uh, kind of relegated at trial. She was at the first chair. She would be uh, what we call doing the moaners and groaners, which are the fact witnesses, you know, the before and after witnesses or whatever. But she came up on one trial and she was talking to some of my clients, uh, kids, teenagers, she snaked my ass. <laughs> I had been working with these kids. I was trying to build some rapport or whatever. And they're like, okay, pretty white lady. Okay, whatever. You know, okay, yeah, they're real polite. But I could tell they were not jamming with me or whatever. This hooker rolls up in there and she's like, hey, what are you doing? I mean, she just was so genuine. And I'm like, find out how she does that. And so everybody's Googling about her, whatever they go. She has two sons. And I'm like, yeah. damn it. <laughs> I'm like, Note to self, adopt two boys. No, I mean, she was just so natural and so good. And I thought, you know what? She can do something I cannot do. Because because here's the thing, a lot of people get, or get so, you know, so much hubris, especially when you have some success. As early as I had my success in my careers, uh, I could have been one of those people you could not have told anything to. But I didn't, I didn't do that. I was always wondering when the other shoe was dropping. I was like, I am way too lucky. Surely you know, something's going to happen, but no, I, I had enough to know that I don't know everything. I'm not the best at everything. Uh, so I want to have, uh, uh, people around me kind of like, um, Abraham Lincoln team of rivals, rivals. Um, you know, sometimes the best people you can learn from are the people you go up against, mm -hmm. but if you have a spirit of cooperation and your heart's in the right place and you're all trying to do good and make the world a better place, it can come together, even if you have different orientations, different political affiliations, that should not be a bar. Sadly, today, our leaders, our political leaders are showing us quite the opposite. They're showing us, if you're not with me, you are my enemy, instead mm -hmm. of looking for what do we like about each other? What can we agree on? So I think it's up to uh, business leaders like us to exemplify another way of working out differences and reaching compromise without losing your core values. Um, let me, uh, Rose, you got anything before we go into the next very serious chapter? Keep it light. Well, I think uh, that's exactly right. Like in our job, a lot of what we do is compromise. You know, we've got to talk to our clients, talk to the people who have positions that are diametrically opposed to ours and come to a mutually agreeable or mutually disagreeable in some situations um, result. Because otherwise, someone's going to lose and someone's going to win, but it does not have to be a zero-sum game. It doesn't have to be zero-sum. Yeah. It doesn't have to be. So, and I think I think women are so much better at knowing that and working towards that because we were not raised with that all-or-nothing fight to die thing. So that's some that's probably some of the better part of our conditioning in our uh, society. But Betsy, <laughs> let's do talk about this before we go to that. I want to say. Betsy, and I know this about Betsy because I went through it myself, like doing this career change, a lot of people will think, well, Betsy was a lawyer and now she's a lawyer. No, 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 no. Mm -hmm. it, is yeah. like, it is like speaking, it's like the difference between speaking French and Japanese. It is mm. not. The right languages. Wow. 
<laughs> it's all communication. Right. It is a true career, career change for her to go from being a defense lawyer in, the, in a very protected, safe environment where you have industry clients, you have insurance clients into this world. It's a totally different practice of law, totally mm -hmm. different set of skills, and it's very scary. So it takes a lot of courage, especially being a woman and a woman yeah. who's raising children. It takes a lot of courage to hit 40 where you're in this environment and you have cultivated all these relationships for 16 years. You reach kind of the pinnacle of success in that environment and then to up and walk away and leave it all behind really, really takes a lot of courage and it's scary. So yeah. kudos to Betsy for doing it because yes. there's very few of us that do it. Dana did it because you know you had a career change when you were raising a young child. Betsy's done it, I've done it. It really, um, you know, Kia just did it when she left her former job and came here. Right. So it really takes a lot of balls. So, you know, kudos to Betsy for having the cojones to do it because not many yeah. people do. Yeah. And Rose, Rose didn't have to come here. <laughs> <laughs> Rose is a brainiac, so she could have gone anywhere, but she just decided, no, I think I'll hang out with this crazy blonde woman and see what happens. So you know, I like y'all. Did you? Enough. You just didn't want us to know? That's easy one they actually like, and she's been here like three days. Okay. <laughs> No, I, I'm very happy for it. And I know it's scary to make a career change, but it, again, when you talk about empowerment, it's about believing in yourself. Because I bet, I bet you anything, I don't know you well at all, but I bet you anything, your mindset was, oh, I will not fail. This yep. will succeed 100%. And you know what? That's all you need to make sure it does. Yeah, I decided to bet on myself. Bet on yourself. Always bet on yourself. I love yeah. that. I love and, that. Uh, I have and a friend who, when he gets his suits made, he gets custom suits, and you flip up the back thing. And you can embroider stuff. And his says, always bet on yourself. I love the reminder. I love it. Mm -hmm. I don't know that bet on themselves and lose, to be honest with you. I don't know a single one. Yeah. That, I mean, that's, that's, cool that's the game. For you. It's not an option. Hey, Betty, know. are you ready to talk? I think I'm going to really enjoy it. Okay. Tell me about your breast cancer journey. Okay. Yeah. So when I was 36, I was taking a shower, felt a lump in my right breast and um, had no family history of breast cancer or anything like that. So I tried not to freak out, but I did call my doctor immediately and got in for, um, for an appointment. And he sent me to get mammogram, uh, mammogram and um, that was inconclusive. So I got a biopsy done and you know, this all happened over the course of like two weeks. So this was yeah. like, you know, while you're at the peak of your mind. career, probably. Right. I had a six-year-old and two four-year-olds at the time too, who I, you know, was taking care of and, you know, I was just carrying on, but this happened over about two weeks. And then I got the call from my radiologist and he said, um, I was at work and he said, Hey, can you, are you in a place where you can talk? And that's when I knew that it wasn't good news. Yeah, your spidey senses were up and down your body, weren't they? Yeah, and so I sat down and he said, well, unfortunately, um, the biopsy is positive for breast cancer. And so I went through some more tests, come to find out it's triple negative breast cancer, which is the worst kind you can have and the most aggressive. And it's the kind that uh, affects younger women, women in their 30s right. and 20s that do get breast cancer. You don't normally have that. So we had to just kind of fly into action and I ended up having a, a double mastectomy and reconstruction and six months of chemotherapy. And um, it was it was a lot. It was tremendously life changing um, going through the physical changes in addition to the emotional changes. And Dana, like I was telling you the other day. Um, my biggest fear was that my children being as young as they were, like, would they have memories of me? Would mm. they just look at photos or um, see videos and hear how they would know me or would they actually, you know, have these memories for themselves? And I, I tried to think back to when I was four and I was like, I don't remember very much. So, no. so that was the most terrifying thing for me um, was that my kids might not remember me if, if, if things went bad. I just threw everything in the kitchen sink at it. I mean, I, I did the most aggressive um, 
chemo drugs they have. And my wonderful doctor, Karen Russell at TMH, um, you know, she understood because she's, we have children who um, are the same age and go to the same school and she's become a very dear friend. And she's probably the smartest person I know. And I really do believe she saved my life. And so I'm almost five years from my last chemo treatment, which is the date that I celebrate. And so March 21st will be five years cancer free. And that's huge in, in cancer world because yes, it is. Um, it's, a, it's an ongoing thing in your life. It can always come back, but the further out you get, the better off you are statistically. So I'm real excited about it. I'm ready for it. Um, you know, it, it's been a long road, but you know, it's taught me so much. You know, put me in touch with some amazing people and I, I've had doors open because of it, believe it or not. And so it's just, it's part of my story now. I'm, I'm appreciative of you, of you um, for sharing it, but it reminds me of a couple of things. And one of them is, thank God you had a woman doctor. Yeah. <laughs> and I'll tell you this because yeah. I remember one particular case we tried, um, my client, uh, how old was she? She was in her forties. I remember when she died, her daughter, her only child was a senior in high school. And I remember she got a diagnosis of DCIS, which is ductal carcinoma in situ. Uh, a lot of people nowadays don't even call that real cancer. Tell it to a woman who has it. Huh. Okay. Tell it, tell that to a woman who has it. And they do that. Okay. I've known a lot of people since this case who've been given uh, an LCIS uh, or a DCIS uh, lobular or ductal uh, in situ, meaning it has not spread. It's right at the site. That's what that means. Uh, and so they don't even consider that real cancer. Well, this woman said, well, I damn sure do do something. And she got a double mastectomy over that. And she's like, and, she, and they said, that's all you need. We got rid of it, cut it out. We got rid of it. And she goes, well, I'm in these, you know, support groups and they say, I really should be on tamoxifen. And especially since I'm premenopausal and uh, oh no, don't worry your pretty little head. You had DCIS. It's nothing. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Well, it wasn't. And so she had had another pathology report for another reason and nobody checked the first pathology report. Nobody talked to the same doctor. And basically she had a report saying, oh no, you've got invasive cancer and it had been sitting in her file in a surgeon's office, an oncologist's office and a um, somebody else's office. Three doctors had this in their office and nobody ever flipped to page two where it said you have invasive cancer. They just told her, uh. and so she died from paternalistic medicine, not cancer. She died from paternalistic medicine. A bunch of men saying, I know better than you <coughs> about what to do with your body. So I am so grateful. And I do believe in my heart, you're here today because you talked to a woman who could relate to you instead of just telling you, how dare you buck up if it's me? How dare you? because that woman's in, but that woman's small invasive cancer over the three years she got absolutely no freaking treatment came back and killed her and she should be here today so i am grateful 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 that you had the luck the insight or whatever to go to an empowered woman doctor who talked to you as an intellectual equal and gave you information you needed to know so you can make informed decisions about your own health care thank the lord well let me tell you how i got her um tell my me. dear friend Jana mcconaughey um, she referred me to Dr. Shelby Blank as my surgeon. So she, Love her. she performed my mastectomy and she sat me down and said, and I asked her, I was like, I need a doctor. Like, who do I go to? And she said, you need Karen Russell. She's, you know, she's, that's the person I want, you know, you're going to connect with her and she's awesome and she's smart and she's brilliant. And so my friend, Jana sent me to Shelby and Shelby sent me to Karen. Yeah. And so it was like, my girls took care of me at every Girl step. <laughs> yeah. And um, yeah, and I'm thankful, very thankful for that. No, that is, that is, I'm so excited to hear that. Um, mm -hmm. And I know so many people, when they go through something like that, when they have little children, their answer, uh, how you do it. And they just basically said, I, I, I don't know any other options. I, I did what I had to do. But that's not entirely true. Uh, if you had that disease older in life, you might have done something differently. Uh, but you have children, you have to do what you got to do. You got to plow through. 
but I just am so grateful that you had wonderful people in your life advising you. Mm -hmm. I really am. <laughs> Terry, I know you've had some experience uh, defending some of these cases and thinking about breast cancer and you probably have some friends. I know you've got some friends because we've, we've talked to yeah. and interviewed them. So uh, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, our law clerk, uh, Connor Bishop's mom was a really good friend of mine and she died from triple, uh, I don't I don't know if she had triple negative or if that was another friend of mine, but she passed, she worked for the Florida bar and she passed away from, from cancer. Oh, from cancer. So but um, you know, it's uh, the misdiagnosis is an extremely difficult position to be in as a lawyer representing a doctor who's misdiagnosed somebody. Yeah. It, it's probably one of the hardest legal positions there is because you have an ethical and a legal obligation to represent his or her best interest, but at the same time, your heart's being ripped out because you feel so much compassion and empathy for the family that's lost a loved one due to the negligence. Yeah. It, it's really hard. I mean, that's why I don't do that work anymore. You know, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do no. it because you can always craft some defense because I remember going to prep doctors, experts, mm. and the lawyers would say, can you say this? Because the lawyer is going, this is how I want to spend this case. And I can't tell you to lie. And I don't want you to lie. Yeah. But can you say this? Mm. You know, <laughs> instead of the truth, it's okay. A lawyer has got some scheme, defense scheme. And so they're asking an expert who's also the buddy of the person getting sued. <laughs> went to medical school together. We all know each other. Like when I when I sue somebody, you better believe I got your ass because I investigated that case a year before you even knew my name. Okay, and I'm spending my own money coming for you, so I'm not playing, sir. So I've got a good expert, and they got you. But when you got when you're doing the defense side, which I carry and. Uh, Betsy used to do you got to defend whatever plot whatever garbage pile plops in your lap so yeah. you got to call everybody you can possibly get who owes you a favor and say listen I know what medicine is but I need you to say this can you say this mm. that's the difference in plaintiffs lawyering and defense lawyering anybody can tear your house down that's what defense lawyers do but it takes a master to build something up to create something that's, that's, that's a right. good lawyer against the law, like the law is not in favor of plaintiffs. The law is written against plaintiffs and in favor of big insurance companies yeah. against- Who can't win on the defense side? If you can't win on the defense side, you are a shit lawyer. You got <laughs> everything going in your way. Plus you got the cynical juries who don't believe anything and think we're all ambulance chasers. Although we're doing God's work. Thank yeah. you, sir. You know what I love about Betsy though and how she handled this? And one of the, you know, Betsy was very active on social media for a long time, especially when she was going through cancer and she calls cancer, cancer, cancer schmancer. And she's so funny about it. She has such a positive attitude and a sense of humor about it that you can't help but fall in love with Betsy. And I'm pretty sure that that kind of positive mentality is probably one of the most healing things she did for her body. Probably. That's a brilliant point. That's a brilliant point. <clears throat> yeah. your, cell, your cells react to your energy. Everything reacts to your energy. You know, I love it. And, you know, that's not to minimize because I've heard this this complaint, too, is, you know, people who've lost loved ones to cancer and then they'll hear other people's cancer stories going. I had children. I had too much to live for. Cancer wasn't going to get me like their their person who died was just weak. That's not true. That's not what we're saying here. Yeah. What we're saying is an empowered woman gets good information from trustworthy sources she vets it she doesn't just do what somebody tells her to do because there's something she's not mm -hmm. she listens she reaches out to her community she pulls up everything she's got uh and sometimes she loses mm -hmm. and we honor those women always but thank god you got the right people you made the right decisions and you beat this and i am so uh, grateful to you for sharing such a personal story with us. But we, we have got about four minutes. So I want to go around to our panel real quick and get some closing remarks. And I wanna give you the last bit here, Betsy. Let's start with Whitney. Whitney Claire. Um, hopefully my, my dogs, sh shut up. Anyway, <laughs> um, I- See where I, she I mean, gets I, her parenting I, techniques. <laughs> hopefully these dogs will just shut up. <laughs> Who's your mother? Who raised you? Honestly, they don't get it. Um, <laughs> no, um, I, I, I have uh, not really been too directly impacted by cancer, but I, I know it's 
it's a horrible thing to go through and it's scary and you probably don't know what tomorrow is going to come and you know chemo i've seen documentation of it and just it's horrible and definitely not something that anyone wishes on their worst enemy yeah. um so i just admire everyone who's been through it i admire people who've lost people from, um, to it and um who see their like it's hard to see your parent weak so i i also hard. imagine it was difficult for your family it's gotta as well. be scary it's existential scary mm -hmm. when it's, your parents it's... seem weak you you know you've got nothing going on if they don't have mm -hmm. it together i'm surely going out yeah mm -hmm. yeah um so i just i i uh, have such a respect for people who go through that especially you're like I'm, oh i'm going to continue I, I have this life now and i'm still going to fight for people you know like as, as a lawyer so i just think that's that's awesome and i'm She's excited awesome. to work with her more in the future and i'm very appreciative of her, her taking her time today yes thank you so much and the snacks i'm not there but i'm jealous of the snacks oh no this was the best best <laughs> little, little kichi quiche that was just crisp it was great in the middle it was perfect i'm all about the air i told you i already got one on uh amazon while y'all were talking <laughs> um kia what are your closing thoughts and remarks today um just want to say i'm happy that you're here um you definitely add to the atmosphere of this fearless woman atmosphere we have going on here i mean we have our empowered men too i'm just saying but i'm happy that you're here and thank you so much for sharing today yeah, I like that. Rose, what about you? Well, I find the whole breast cancer conversation very yeah. interesting on multiple yeah. levels, because obviously there's a lot of attention paid to it and that it's a good thing. Like as Dana, you and I have talked as medical malpractice lawyers, like the standard of care is changing all the time with breast yeah. cancer because- right there's, you know, we're learning about it. Cancer research is happening and we are learning about what is supposed to be done, but it is also so tied up with, you know, your looks and, oh, yeah. and losing your hair and your all breast, that. Yeah. everything that yeah. makes you feel like a woman. So, you know, my mother went through breast cancer and she yeah. had a double mastectomy and she had a male surgeon Mm. And um, she's never been a very you know, vain, appearance-driven person, but it was always just like, okay, here's what you do. You have the mastectomy, you have the, the expanders put in, you have the reconstruction, you have this. And she's in her 60s now, and she's like, really, I maybe if I had, you know, had the choice, I would not have had breast implants put in. Like, what freaking use do I have for that now? I don't need a um, shelf right now. But no. it was just, it was just what you did. Yeah. So, you know, I think it's, it's all very fascinating. And I'm happy to have you know, Betsy here given a perspective on it as a younger person, because my mother had cancer when she was older. Um, yeah. But, you know, happy to have you here for many reasons beyond Many cancer. reasons. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I, here's the thing too, Betsy, believe it or not, we had a case here. It wasn't my case, but I got involved in it and it was an auto accident. And this woman, uh, she was belted in and the airbag went off or whatever, but she got a large hematoma on her breast and it wouldn't resolve. It wouldn't resolve. It wouldn't resolve. And so finally she gets some imaging, you know, what are we gonna have to do? And they found breast cancer. Oh, wow. Here's the problem. They couldn't excise it. It would have been normally a lumpectomy case, but they could not because of the hematoma. So that auto accident turned into breast cancer, double mastectomy, expander, yada, yada case because the treatment options normally available to her for something that would have been a lumpectomy were no longer available. They couldn't remove the, the cancer and get clean margins because of the, the uh, hematoma. So believe it or not, even if you're not doing med mal, breast cancer can come up in your life. Sometimes we've had clients, we're just representing them for a slip and fall. Meanwhile, during this process, they uh, develop breast cancer. And so we've got to be there for them through that. So I know based on just the limited information I have heard on some of these cases, I know how valuable your insight uh, can be. And, I, and so I'm just so appreciative that you are here, number one, and number two, that you're willing to share such a difficult, you know, painful journey. Um, mm -hmm. And I just, I just I, I applaud you every day. You're a shero of the first order. Uh, Kia and Carrie wrapping up today. Thoughts? 
Go ahead, Kia. Well, I just said thank you. I think Carrie, it's on you. I'm gonna bounce it. There you go. Thank you, Carrie. <laughs> So I just, I think it's so interesting that we have like a Wonder Woman. What's the island in Wonder Woman? What's the name of it? Does anybody know? I keep trying to think about it all the time because I'm like, I made this. I right. made this island. <laughs> so we You're have this. Amazons. Yeah, we yeah, have this. Glamaz I want us to be Glamazons though because I think we're also yeah. cute. But we have this island of, of incredibly capable, successful, powerful individual women. And we're not only all those things, but we're better than all the other male PI lawyers. So we let's not <laughs> seriously. So I'm so happy that Betsy is one of us and that yes. we we found her and she found us and it was kismet and it worked out. And I just think it's gonna be a wonderful journey. So I welcome to the island, Betsy. Welcome to the island, sweetheart. Uh what do you want to say in closing today, Betsy? Just that I'm here and thank you guys for giving me the opportunity and trusting me to bring me in onto your island. And um, <laughs> Thanks for asking me these questions about me and letting me share my story with you guys. You've made me feel very, um, it's been a very warm welcome and I, I Good. appreciate that. Good, and we hope that you will join us on the panel for the Empower Hours. We miss Kip, Kimmy Hogan today. She was uh, caught up in a deposition and we're all gonna have those moments where we can't be here and it may be hosted by somebody else and we may have different panel members, but I'm so glad to have one more empowered woman with such mm -hmm. diverse experiences background and uh, compassion, really genuine concern for the people we try to serve every day at Basic Brooks. We know that when you come to us, you're not having your best day and you may act out and lash out because you're hurting. But I want you to know you're gonna be heard by people who genuinely care about you when you come here. So thank you for watching. Thank you everyone for participating as usual. And we will see you back here next Thursday at 4 30 Facebook live and we're about to be on a podcast so more to follow on that but Facebook live next week on the empower plant for the empower hour thank you so much for watching everyone bye, bye.